the Nintendo 64. This console holds a special place in my heart. It wasn't my first game console as a kid, but it was the one that I spent the most time with. Unfortunately, as it's gotten older, it's become harder and harder to enjoy. At almost 30 years old, it's got an antiquated video connector that I can't plug into any of my TVs, a jumbo-sized power brick that's honestly on its last legs, I can hear it humming every time I plug it in, and a controller that was controversially shaped even when it first came out. So today, I would like to create the ultimate modernized Nintendo 64. And in order to do it, we are going to utilize some cutting edge technology Ow. and we're going to experiment with a whole bunch of techniques that I have never done before. So without further ado, let's get into it. The inside of the Nintendo 64 is a fascinating place filled with all sorts of odd design choices. I have to imagine this is how archeologists must feel when they're cracking open thousand year old tombs. But some things are delightfully consistent, like the fact that you need a special driver in order to open it, just like a modern Nintendo. The first oddity is this giant multi-layered heat spread. We're definitely gonna be replacing this. Similarly, there's a ton of wasted space, and I feel like a modern system should be designed to occupy as little space as possible. Once I had it stripped down to just the main motherboard, it was time to scrub away several decades of dirt, grime, and just general nastiness. Isopropyl alcohol was great for this. Then it was time for the first major upgrade, but it's not really a modern one. This is one of the original N64 RAM expansion packs. We'll modify this a bit later, but this is an important piece of the puzzle because you can't play every N64 title without one. Finally, it was time to strip away some dead weight. We'll be completely replacing the external power delivery system, so I decided to desolder the power connector in order to save a little bit of space. And the same thing applies to the original video output port as well. Both of these would have been a lot easier to remove if I had a hot air rework station, but I did manage to get it done with just a basic soldering iron. So the next thing that I want to do is modernize the video output of the Nintendo 64, because at this point, I don't even think that I have a single TV or monitor anywhere in my house that has an RCA input or an RF input. So we are going to install a little accessory board on the Nintendo 64 that allows it to output via HDMI. This right here is known as an HDMI mod, and they're actually sold by a bunch of different companies. The problem is they're usually really expensive and they're also really hard to find in stock anywhere. But I went on AliExpress and I actually found this one that sells for 50 bucks and is in stock all day long. Does it perform as well as some of the other ones? Well, we won't really know until we install it. And here's the crazy thing. Most manufacturers of these boards won't even let you install them yourself. That's right, many of them are sold only through authorized installers because they require micro soldering. In order to capture the video signal and upscale it for output via HDMI, we have to steal the video signal as it comes off the processor. And that means soldering this ribbon cable directly to its pins. But don't worry, it's not as hard as it sounds. I used some caps on tape to hold the ribbon in place, cleaned up the contacts with some flux, and then got ready to do some drag soldering. This is a technique where you apply a bit of solder to the tip of your iron and then drag it over the contacts you want to join together. The nice thing about solder is that it's attracted to the contacts, so generally it's going to go where you want it to go. The main thing that you have to watch out for is accidentally applying too much and bridging adjacent pins. Take your time, less is more, and you can always remove excess solder with a solder wick. It should look a little something like this when you're done. Next, I stole power for the HDMI mod from this nearby voltage regulator and soldered this last leg to the second pin on the PIF chip. And that's it. We should now be able to play our N64 games in glorious 720p. Let's move on to upgrading the cooling. The original heat sinks for the N64 are big, ugly, and made out of aluminum. So I bought these perfectly sized copper heat sinks that will fit directly on top of the main heat generating components. They're much more thermally conductive and shaped in a way that should make them much more effective at radiating heat. I also attached them with some of the highest performance thermal pads on the market, which should be a big improvement over the almost 30 year old ones that were there before. Oh, and then later I also did the RAM expansion pack once I found some copper heat sinks that were small enough to fit. So would you look at that? We actually managed to get it done and honestly, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I mean, it wasn't easy, mind you. However, with a little bit of practice, I think just about anybody could do this. And that's key there, 
practice. I did actually practice before I did this. This is a micro soldering practice board. It's basically just a PCB. It comes with some microchips and you can practice soldering them in place. It was a really good chance for me to test out my drag soldering skills and work on things in a non mission critical scenario. So well worth it. I'll include some links for this as well as all the other tools and materials that I've used throughout this project down in the video description. Now that we figured out how we're going to get video out of the Nintendo 64, let's talk about how we're going to get power in. I want to power this system with the most ubiquitous power connector in my house, USB-C. And thanks to the new USB-C power delivery standard, a little wall adapter and cable like this should supply more than enough power for the Nintendo 64. But just because it's simple and clean looking doesn't mean it's going to be easy because the Nintendo 64 needs a couple of different voltages in order to run. So let's talk about how we're going to deal with that. This first board is a USB power delivery breakout module, and it communicates with a power brick and tells it how much voltage to supply. By setting these dip switches, we can configure it to request one of the operating voltages for the N64, 12 volts. I then soldered a bunch of leads to the output terminals. Most of these will go directly to the motherboard, but one pair will go to the second auxiliary board. By soldering this terminal right here, we can configure this module to step down 12 volts to just 3.3 which is the other voltage that we need. From there, all I had to do was solder on a few wires that will connect back to the original power delivery terminals on the main motherboard. And can we just take a second to appreciate how much smaller these new boards are than the original power brick? It's crazy how far technology has come. As a final step, of course, I had to plug in the power and test to see if everything still worked. If you look at that, it actually works. Or. I mean, at least I think it works. We don't really know until we get it hooked up to a video display and see if we can get anything out of it. So now that we've got the electronics sorted, the next thing that I wanna do is build a case for the Nintendo 64. And in order to do that, we are going to be exploring some really cool technology. This is the UltraCraft Reflex 3D printing system from Hay Gears, and it's a resin-based 3D printing system. Now, there are a whole host of reasons why resin-based 3D printing is superior to FDM style 3D printing that most people are familiar with. But the one that I am the most excited about is the fact that you can print transparent plastic. So we can embrace that old retro style of a clear plastic case. Like I said at the start of this video, this is a technology that I have never worked with before, and I'm excited to learn all the ins and outs of it, but I figured if it's something new, might as well start small. So down here, you can see a little preview of what we're about to print, and it's actually a new cartridge for the Nintendo 64. The first thing that you have to know about resin 3D printing is that it's a lot more involved than FDM style printing. But Hay Gears has created a completely integrated system that makes the process as streamlined and as user-friendly as you possibly could. For example, their printers will automatically detect which resin has been loaded into it, how much resin is in the build tank, and it'll even automatically add more during the print if necessary. You see, resin 3D printers work by using an LCD screen to expose UV-sensitive resin one layer at a time, and your model slowly grows up and out of the build tank. It's a really cool process. This particular printer has a 6K LCD screen, so it's capable of creating incredibly detailed prints. And their Blueprint Slicer software was great for a newbie like me. Not only did it identify potential problem areas in my models and tell me how I can fix them, but it also controls all three machines wirelessly. After a print is finished, you're going to have to wash it in the aptly named wash station. This is just a big tub filled with isopropyl alcohol that dissolves uncured resin through agitation. But Hay Gears designed this ingenious two-chamber system where you never have to reach into a tank full of alcohol to get your parts. You can just drain the alcohol into a second tank and then pick up your parts once they're dry. Next comes removing the supports, and this was actually pretty tricky at times because of the way I designed my models. At the end of the video, during the post-mortem analysis, we'll talk about how I could have made this a whole lot easier for myself. When the supports do finally let go though, it's incredibly satisfying to peel them away and reveal your finished parts. The quality and detail of these resin prints blew me away and it's like nothing that I have ever seen before from any other printer. The last step was just putting the parts into the cure station. Here, they're exposed to both heat and more UV light in order to fully cure the resin. Again, this is all controlled by the Blueprint Slicer. Depending on the size and shape of your parts, Hay Gears will automatically dial in the perfect settings so you get fantastic results every time. 
With the first couple of parts done, I loaded up my next set of models, hit print, and then went to check out a seriously cool piece of hardware that just arrived in the mail. This right here is an EverDrive 64. And basically, this is every single Nintendo 64 game ever, or at least it can be. So if you look right here, there's a little SD card slot. And what you can do is load up a bunch of your favorite ROMs onto an SD card, put it in here, plug this into the Nintendo 64, and it'll play it just like the original cartridges. So my plan is to take all the Nintendo 64 games that I own and then just do exactly that. That way I never have to change cartridges. How modern is that? And then also another cool feature about this is that it has a built-in NES emulator so you can play old school games too. Unfortunately, the best part of the EverDrive 64 is hidden away where no one will ever see it. Except for us, that is. Oh, look at that black and gold PCB. That is gonna look so cool in our clear shell. Stuff like this is why I was so excited to make a clear Nintendo 64. There are just so many cool details hidden inside these machines that often get covered up by boring bland plastic. But I'm sure many of you at home are probably noticing that our clear resin looks significantly less clear than it did fresh out of the printer. And don't worry, we will be fixing that, but first, over the course of the next few days, I still had to print all of the other parts. Ow. And I've gotta say, after working with the UltraCraft Reflex system, I get why people love resin 3D printing so much. Not only do these parts feel way more substantial in your hand, due to the fact that they're printed at 100% infill, but the surface finish on them is something that has to be seen in order to be believed. It's bordering on the same quality as injection molded plastic. And when you can get that level of quality and precision at home, all wrapped in a user-friendly package, it becomes pretty easy to imagine how the UltraCraft Reflex system could become the production cornerstone of your business, whether it's selling prints on Etsy or just making your own custom consoles the way that I do. But obviously, we still have a big question to answer. So let's talk about post-processing and how we're going to restore that crystal clear look to this resin. The first step is wet sand. Over in the shop, I laid out a series of sandpaper sheets that range from 200 to 2000 grit, and I meticulously polished each part. This is really a case of you get out of it what you're willing to put into it. The more time you spend sanding and polishing your parts, the clearer they're going to be. So where you stop is kind of up to you. After that, I thoroughly cleaned all the parts with more isopropyl alcohol, and already I could see that my plastic was looking a lot more clear. But I knew we could still do better. So I dried off the parts, improvised a way to hang them outside, and then sprayed on several thin coats of acrylic automotive clear coat. Not only will this finish fill in all the little micro scratches on the surface of the plastic, but it will also provide long-term UV protection for the parts and help them to maintain their clear look over time. Once the acrylic dried, I inspected the results and they were pretty fantastic. Oh man, look at how cool some of these parts look. I mean, my spray paint job isn't perfect in all the places, but it's not bad and it's definitely a lot clearer than it was when it came out of the printer. Finally, it was time to assemble the case that I had worked so hard to create. And thankfully, this part was pretty easy thanks to my design. The front panel magnetically attaches, so I glued six pairs of magnets into both the top and the bottom half of the console. Installing them as pairs like this ensures that I won't accidentally mix up their polarity. The glue needed a second to set, so I busied myself by installing a bed of double-sided tape over here where the PCB for the HDMI mod will go. And then I installed six brass standoffs to support the main motherboard. I undersized all of these holes ever so slightly, so as I'm screwing them in here, they're actually cutting their own threads. These standoffs create just enough clearance under the main motherboard that both the HDMI mod and the power delivery boards can sit comfortably below everything else. And this seems like a good time to mention that if anybody wants to tackle this project at home, I'm going to make all of these 3D print files available for purchase over on my store. I'll put a link down in the video description. And of course, the standoffs were positioned so that I could just screw down through these original mounting holes and secure the motherboard. The top and the bottom simply pressure fit and click together, and the final step was adding a bit of glue to these magnet holes and pressing the front panel into position. Not bad looking, but I wasn't done just yet. You see, I hear that Nintendo doesn't really like it when you use their name, so I decided to create my own custom branding for this project. And I was looking at the Nintendo 64 logo, and I noticed something about it. If you just kind of turn it 90 degrees, that N becomes a Z. So I think we can exploit that. 
A simple rotation wasn't quite enough to achieve the effect I wanted here, so I also applied a subtle perspective shift in order to sell the whole effect a bit better. Then, obviously, I had to replace the word Nintendo with my own name in a font that is similar, but Nintendo's lawyer should note is distinctly different than the original. And then, of course, there's also the infamous 64, which in this case refers to the number of vertices and faces on my 3DZ. There we go, we now have our custom Zach Build 64 logo, and the next thing we need to do is print that out onto a vinyl sticker. However, I don't have a vinyl sticker printer, but I do have a friend who has one, so I think it's time I cashed in a little favor. Turns out it's way easier to make vinyl stickers than I ever thought. All you need is printable vinyl, a color printer, and a Cricut. And if you've never seen a Cricut before, they're pretty neat. It's basically like someone replaced a printer's ink dispenser with a small knife. It can quickly and easily cut out custom shapes from a whole range of different materials. Once it was done, I peeled off the backing paper and carefully attached it to the front of the cartridge. Now that we're done with that, I have one last little cherry that I want to add on top of this project. In my mind, there is one key feature that separates modern consoles from their old retro cousins of yesteryear. And if I didn't include it in this project, well then I don't think I could really call this a modern Nintendo 64. That's right, I'm talking about wireless controllers. This is a Brawler 64, and it allows you to enjoy your games without being tethered in place by a plastic umbilical cord. And it also redesigns the controller, which, like I said before, hasn't aged particularly well. So let's unbox it and see how it feels. Okay, so that's interesting. I'll show you what that is in a second. And that's the controller itself. Okay, well that actually feels quite a bit better than I would have expected at first glance. Right off the bat, you have two Z buttons instead of just one. In terms of layout, it's actually really similar to an Xbox Series controller. The buttons feel very clicky and not mushy at all. Well, okay, the shoulder buttons are a tiny bit mushy, but not bad. The analog stick feels really good, I like that. Not bad for a third-party peripheral control. You probably wouldn't give this to your little brother. <laughs> so this module just plugs right in here. If you look here, you'll see that it has a port for a memory card. We won't actually need that. I don't think I covered this earlier, but the EverDrive 64 actually has save functionality built right into it. So I won't ever have the need for a memory card, but obviously they made this for a normal Nintendo 64, so I can understand why they would include that. Now that we got all of those little things done, we can finally do something that I've been wanting to do for a long time now. We can test this thing. Oops, so let's forgot this. You guys see how easy that was? It's just two cables and this nearly 20 year old system is connected and running to a modern TV. So when you first boot up, this is the EverDrive 64 main screen. This page here has a bunch of settings. You can also do emulation here. You have Game Boy, Game Boy Color, NES. And then if you come back to this page, you have all of your games here, or at least I have all of my games here. Like I said earlier, theoretically, you could have every single Nintendo 64 game here. However, I've just stuck to the ones that I actually own because I'm trying to keep things legit for this YouTube video. And look at how crisp all of this is. So the Nintendo 64 is outputting a 720p signal and then my TV is upscaling that to 4K and it's a four by three aspect ratio. That's why you have these black bars on either side. Okay, so let's boot up a game and see how it looks. Uh, obviously Mario 64. Oh, and you can also do cheats. You can do ROM configuration, like changing where it saves and stuff like that. But yeah, let's start the game. Oh, I forgot about these long unskippable intros. So right away, you notice that the image is just way crisper right now. And another nice thing here is you have really vivid colors. I've played Nintendo 64s with HDMI converters and they often end up with really washed out colors, but that is not the case here. Everything is looking really good. When you compare this AliExpress HDMI mod to the more expensive ones out there, you are missing out on a few features like the ability to change your output resolution. This one is locked at 720p, but practically speaking, that's the resolution that I would have picked anyways. The more expensive boards only offer a 1080i interlay signal. And this board also gives you the ability to change your aspect ratio and your colors, though I don't think I would ever do that because these all look pretty gross. And I also gotta say, this controller, the input latency is basically non-existent. I think it's running a custom 2.4 gigahertz signal, so that makes sense. I mean, just trying to do the classic triple jump, no problem. 
When I was running it on an emulator before, I often had a hard time with that because it's pretty sensitive to timing, but this feels just like it used to. And the really precise inputs of the analog stick are there too. You can really control Mario's speed really precisely. This is a good replica controller. And I'm sure some people at home are probably wondering about thermals. And yeah, I can feel a little bit of heat coming out of here. So what do you say we bust out the thermal camera and see how the chips in here are doing? Yeah, look at that. So it's been on for about an hour now. We're getting into the 60 degree mark right on the top of the chip there. But if you look closely, the actual heat sinks are significantly cooler than that. Yeah, I would say that that is well within spec. Oh, it's like barely even warm to the touch. So this is really everything that I ever could have wanted out of a modernized Nintendo 64, which I'm realizing now is a bit of a oxymoron. But just because it's everything I wanted doesn't mean that I couldn't do it better if I had to do it again. So let's talk post-warm analysis. One thing I definitely could have improved on this project are the 3D printed parts. I've never worked with 3D printed resin before and I didn't really base my models around the limitations of the medium. In the future, I would avoid having all of these large flat sections and also I probably would have oriented my models so that the supports were on the outside of the case and then they would have been easier to remove during the post-processing. I also think it would have been cool to add a little bit of active cooling to this project. It's not really necessary, but keeping these parts even cooler might add some additional longevity to this geriatric system. And then finally, I thought about this one at the end, but since I don't really need this memory card slot here, I could have just disassembled this and then wired it to the backside of the controller ports. I mean, how cool would this thing have been with four wireless controllers and then no ports along the front? I think that would have looked really cool. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and you might want to get subscribed so that you don't miss my next video where I make my own DIY air quality meter or maybe it'll be my DIY Dolby Atmos speakers. Either way, get subscribed and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.